A simple concept. You walk into a building and type Get Lamp, one that in 1976 sparked a new genre of video games alongside a new method of playing them. It began with Will Crowther, a spelunker and developer working on Harponet. He came up with the idea of creating a video game that would not only let you explore a cave where you would go from room to room picking up items you need to solve puzzles and continue onwards with the aim of collecting treasures scattered throughout, but also aimed to be approachable. It was to be named Colossal Cave Adventure, and it would be accessible to people in ways that most games couldn't be up to this point. There were no fiddly controls, no keyboard shortcuts to remember, no odd controllers. You had to talk to the computer, you had to tell it what to do, and if your commands were part of its vocabulary it would understand and execute them. Crowther created it on the PDP-10 mainframe that he worked on, then went on vacation and came back to see that everyone was playing it. It caught on quite quickly, and with it the adventure game genre was created. With the help of another developer named Don Woods, it became the adventure we know today, containing more fantastical elements and offering many more people the chance to get lost through its numerous rooms, figuring out how to get the next door open. And yet, even though there were no graphics to it, and it was only a wall of text, it still felt a bit more lively than Mist ever did, but we'll get to that this summer. Colossal Cave Adventure was not nearly the only game to be created that year. One of the most famous and most played titles ever made was released in the arcades by Gremlin Interactive in 1976. It was named at the time Blockade, but people would soon know it better under the name Snake and probably played it for weeks on their phones. It also got what is considered to be the first hand-to-hand -hand fighting game ever made, in the form of Heavyweight Champ created by Sega. It wasn't a very complicated boxing game, but without it, we'd probably not have had a punch out in a few weeks. Arcades were booming in 1976, and the home market was expanding rapidly. It was estimated that by the end of the year, over 3.5 million home games were sold, generating over $240 million in revenue for the fledgling industry thanks to groundwork set about by the Magnavox Odyssey and Pong. There were clones everywhere now getting cheaper and more accessible by the moment. And some of them came with innovation, like the Fairchild Video Entertainment System, later renamed the Fairchild Channel F. It was the first home console to use ROM cartridges, the first one to use a microprocessor, in this case one developed by Fairchild itself. And it is considered as being the one that started the second generation of video game consoles, adding features that were undreamt of in the Odyssey, such as an AI to compete against or games that spanned across multiple screens. As for Atari itself, it was riding high. Not only because it was enjoying great success with new titles like Night Driver and the best-selling home edition of Pong, but also because the company was bought out this year by Warner Communication, starting a long chain of seemingly endless acquisitions that have left Atari as it is now, a name, a shell with no meaning. Nolan Bushnell got $28 million on the deal and continued to work at the company for the time being. He even collaborated with a few new up-and-coming developers to create a game called Breakout. Those developers were two guys named Steve that alongside another guy named Ronald Wood in 1976 found a company. It was then called Apple Computers Company, and its first product was a personal computer dubbed the Apple One, built by hand by Steve Wozniak. Only around 200 of them were ever made, since they were constructed in a very rudimentary process that didn't really allow for mass production. After all, this was a computer housed in a wooden casing. It was built in a garage, and it had somewhat limited capabilities. But it was a profitable venture. Wozniak's invention alongside Steve Jobs' incredible ability to sell it may not have revolutionized anything at the time, only having a limited impact, but it would create a powerhouse that would soon fuel the computing industry for years to come. More on that next week. As for Ronald Wayne, he called it quits after a few weeks and cashed out for around $800. This action has gone down in history as one of the worst financial decisions ever taken by an individual as his shares of Apple would have been worth now over $50 billion. 
1976 was a year of many firsts. The first space shuttle rolled out of production and entered testing. The first Concorde took flight nearly a decade after the promise of supersonic flight was made. The first VHS player was created and one of the first format wars began between it and the Betamax. The first Ebola virus outbreak took place. And the term meme was first used in the book The Selfish Gene written by evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. At the time it wasn't entirely referring to pictures of cats wanting cheeseburgers in case you're wondering, but to the spread of ideas and cultural phenomenon of which that cat picture is a part of. I think there is a little doubt as to what would be the game of 1976. Colossal Cave Adventure, or Advent or simply Adventure as it's often called, represents a landmark moment in video games. This wasn't about sports, this wasn't a game about swinging swords at things, about management, it was about exploration in a way that everyone could understand. Not of the stars in a complicated ship, not of a dungeon filled with monsters, but of the world and everything in it, using just words. It was the precise moment when we went from mainframe games requiring you to have deep knowledge of what you were playing in the first place to just talking to the game and it understanding you. A process so easy to get that it would become the basic method by which an entire genre would be controlled for the next decade. A method of control that is still quite popular. I even made a dedicated show about it entitled Whatever Happened to the Text Adventure Game that I encourage you to watch. And as I've said in a previous episode, Colossal Cave Adventure would inspire people to dream of more than just exploring rooms all by themselves with different and interlocking puzzles. It was the foundation for a revolution of the mind. Next week, the gaming industry switches into high gear and expands to new horizons. Everything that came up until now will seem small, which is why people tend to not remember these years. They consider that there wasn't much to them, and if we're talking volume, yeah, absolutely. What would come in just a few more months dwarfs it immeasurably, but without this period, from 1967 to 1976, we wouldn't have gotten a games industry. So this period, this genesis, must always be remembered, must always be treasured, as well as the origins of video games, and titles like Tennis for Two, and the minds of people working with instruments built for war, dreaming of a time of peace. So come back next week when we go to the next level, to a new age of gaming. Goodbye.